Good morning. Welcome back to day two. Uh, you've already been introduced multiple times to our co-organizer, Paul Jones. I will merely add that his first book, The Humanity of Christ, Christology, and Karl Barth's Church Dogmatics, originated as a dissertation at Harvard University. Um, during that time, he was studying with both Ron Thiemann and Sarah Coakley. And Sarah told me a few years later that she had encouraged him, said that he should go to Princeton and see the Wallas. And so he came down to talk to me and George. And uh, that was my first acquaintance with him during that process. He is currently co-editing the Oxford Handbook of Karl Barth with Paul Nimmo, who is known to many of us. And he's doing a constructive work entitled Patience, a Theological Explora Exploration, something I'm very eager to see. Um, I'm not gifted much with patience, <laughs> and I think it's a very good virtue to have. Um, so I'm interested to see. Paul tells me he already has 200,000 words written. So it's, a, it's an, a massive project, and we look forward to seeing that. Please join me in welcoming Paul Jones. My paper is uh, titled, Liberation Theology After Charlottesville. In 2017, there was a succession of far-right demonstrations in Charlottesville, Virginia, the city where I live. On March 13th, sympathizers of the alt-right, which is a loose coalition of white supremacists, white nationalists, anti-Semites, neo-Nazis, and some others, they marched between two parks and held a torch-lit rally. The immediate purpose was to protest the proposed removal of a statue of Robert E. Lee. And a broader goal was to strike a blow in the so-called war on whites that is apparently waged by Jewish elites, people of color, and the political establishment. And there was plenty of chanting. In addition to the notorious pairing of blood and soil, participants used a slogan championed by a contemporary white nationalist group, namely, you will not replace us. Then on July 8th, a few months later, a Ku Klux Klan group rallied near a statue of Thomas Stonewall Jackson. City of Charlottesville um, arranged community events and discouraged counter-protests. Uh, however, the Klan were met with fierce resistance on the part of local clergy, the Charlottesville chapters of Black Lives Matter and Surge showing up for racial justice. After the Klan had departed, some counter-protesters disregarded a call to disperse, and there followed some scuffles, some arrests, and some counter-protesters were tear-gassed. Finally, if that weren't all enough, a tragic denouement. On the evening of August 11th, a procession of torch-bearing white supremacists marched through the University of Virginia. City and university officials knew about the event before it occurred, yet took no concrete steps to hinder it. And neither UVA nor city police were present when student counter-protesters and white supremacists fought beneath a statue of Thomas Jefferson. There was more chanting, too. Blood and soil, white lives matter, hail Trump, and you will not replace us, which was sometimes modulated to Jews will not replace us. The next day, at 8.31, about 30 heavily armed members of the Pennsylvania and New York Lightfoot Militia appeared at a park downtown. A little later, affiliates of various far-right groups arise, arose, I'm sorry, arrived. Meanwhile, after a sunrise service and a march, very, various clergy and faith leaders had positioned themselves on the edge of a street in front of the park with the intention of disrupting the far-right rally. They locked arms, they sang hymns, and they prayed as other counter-protesters assembled nearby. About 10 a.m., some scuffles had broken out. Later that hour, 
The participants in the Unite the Right rally tried to push through a clergy blockade at the park's southeast staircase. Then, shortly before 11 a.m., and this is a quote from the official report, a massive column of hundreds of Unite the Right demonstrators marched west toward the southeast entrance of Emancipation Park. Led by members of the League of South and Traditionalist Workers' Party, that's a secessionist slash white nationalist organization and a neo-Nazi group, these demonstrators, quote, wore helmets and carried shields, flagpoles, and pepper spray. The crowd of counter-protesters saw this, and they rushed east to form their own blockade in front of the clergy. They locked arms and blocked Market Street. Eyewitnesses and participants, they believe that this additional blockade, which was forged and held by ostensibly uh, non-religious actors willing to absorb and to respond to the violence of the alt-right, that additional blockade protected the clergy and faith-based activists from grave physical harm. Events spiraled further out of hand, and the police, who at this point had been little more than bystanders, declared a state of unlawful assembly. At that point, protesters and counter-protesters moved onto the streets. Subsequent to racist taunts and threats, an aerosol was lit and directed at far-right demonstrators. In response, a Ku Klux Klan leader shot his handgun on the ground next to a counter-protester. After an altercation over a flag, a counter-protester named DeAndre Harris was beaten by, quote, a mob of angry alt-right demonstrators with flag sticks, shields, and pieces of wood. In the early afternoon, a, a participant in the alt-right rally purposefully drove his car into a crowd. Numerous individuals were injured and traumatized. A local activist named Heather Heyer was killed. These events, of course, precipitated much reflection. The obvious question constantly raised, granted that far-right groups have long been a fixture of the political landscape in the US, what exactly occasioned this upsurge of activity? Now, there are various responses to this question, none of which are mutually exclusive. One might say, for instance, that explicitly racist and anti-Semitic ideologies which were previously the preserve of fringe groups like the American Nazi Party, are now being mainstreamed by media-savvy activists who sense a new receptivity to white nationalism in the Republican Party and among some citizens. Charlottesville, on this reckoning, was a canny pitch for the limelight, a cameo in advance of a starring role on the national stage. A different answer. This is the resurgence of what Richard Hofstadter famously called the paranoid style in American politics. As with McCarthyism, the John Birch Society, and Barry Goldwater in the 1950s and the 1960s, so today. Some segment of the population has embraced the idea of a grand conspiracy led by Jewish financiers, who are now personified by George Soros, traitorous presidents and faceless bureaucrats, That'll be Obama and the deep state, and leftist saboteurs, which today is academics peddling cultural Marxism. Another possible answer, a condition of economic precarity combined with suspicions about big government and a media powerhouse that trades in anti-black, anti-brown, and anti-immigrant disinformation, all this has catalyzed new forms of political engagement. So an acute maldistribution of wealth plus shifting demographics equals existential certainty and resentment. Existential uh, uncertainty and resentment plus longstanding patterns of racism plus rampant ideological manipulation equals an invigorated far right. One more answer for good measure. The events of Charlottesville are no mystery at all. They're simply another Nadir in the racist tragedy playing out in the United States albeit one encouraged by a president who embraces the rhetoric and imagery of white supremacists, fascists, and anti-Semites. Charlottesville and the city of Virginia, on the one side, 
a city with a long history of enslavement and discrimination. On the other side, an institution founded by a pioneer of white supremacism that still prevaricates on the issue of racial justice. Both Charlottesville and UVA have always endangered Jews and people of color, so there's nothing new here. Granted that the current incumbent of the White House adds fuel to the fire, plus a change. I begin this way because it's imperative for theologians based in North America to reckon seriously with these events. To refrain from doing so, perhaps under cover of supposedly non-political doctrinal concerns, perhaps in light of an outsized focus on ecclesial matters, that would amount to a disavowal of responsibility for the patch of creation that we are given to inhabit. It would signal a refusal to treat our quotidian as overarched and ordered to the covenant of grace, wherein divine favor waits on grateful, responsible, and free human response. In 1942, Karl Barth noted that the rise of Nazism was observed with, quote, a certain superficial sensational interest. The most delightful complacency, the strongest possible determination not to see the danger, not to have to meet it under any circumstances. I'm uncertain about the extent to which parallels are between, obtained between the US and Germany in the 20s and 30s, but the observation and the implicit counsel are apropos. Neither, sensationaling, ni neither sensationalization nor complacency should be possible when fascism looms. With all that said, and granted the dangerous political moment in which we live, I also believe there should be no loss of theological nerve. Justifiable moral outrage, tough-minded sociological analyses, and relentless political vigilance, necessary as all these are, they mustn't supply a theologian with his or her center of gravity. The Christian imagination, to borrow Willie Jennings's fine phrase, must not be colonized by far-right activism no matter its fantastical depths, no matter its influence. Sinfulness and God-saving activity are not poles in a fluctuating dialectic, so that the theologian might focus more on the former and less on the latter when things get tough. Nor does the simultaneity of sin and justification in Christian life license a tragic view of human sociality on this side of the eschaton such that Christian political theology can do little more than dispel, quote, mild illusions about human virtues and moral capacities while tipping its hat, quote, to an ethic of progressive justice. If the Christian imagination is to flourish, we must do what is always needful, attend to the divine subject who graciously reveals herself and whose self-disclosure means undeserved grace and our capacitation as good and faithful servants. Should we then, quote, endeavor to carry on theology and only theology now as previously as if nothing had happened, as Barr proposed in 1933? Not exactly. While I certainly follow Barth in believing that God's self-communicative action sets the pace for dogmatics, I want, to today, I want today to propose that the context in which theology is done and to which theologians are responsible be enlarged and to some degree reconceived. Context in which theology have done, what does that mean? Well, the question is not easy to answer. Even as Bart insists that theology is a function of the church, that's one one, Bart's actualism often makes the church a bit hard to pin down. The, quote, earthly historical form of Jesus Christ, his body created and continually removed by the awakening power of the Holy Spirit, this, in the dogmatics, can sometimes as appear as much a mobile event as an empirically circumscribable institution. At any rate, my constructive suggestion today is going to intensify the open-endedness and the dynamism of Bart's ecclesiology. Fairly riskily, I want to stretch the meaning of church to include, at its margins, sites of resistance to the far right. 
I want to extend the scope of the church's, quote, self-examination in its internal and external mission in ways that Bart probably could not have anticipated and perhaps would not countenance. Specifically, I want to pay close attention to, this is Bart again, works of love amongst the sick, the weak, and those in jeopardy, with relatively little regard for whether these works are complemented by a discernible acknowledgement of the Lordship of Christ and his spirit. Now, this does not mean, I hurry to add, that the, that the visible church is slighted. What Karl Barth calls ecclesiastical deceitism is not an option. It is only through the visible church in all of its shame, its mediocrity, and its dignity that we encounter scripture and come to know who God is and what God is doing. The purpose here is a bit different. Presuming this visible center, I want to reach towards a opaque periphery and to entertain that this possibility and, and to entertain the possibility that this periphery is, well, less peripheral than those of us who dwell near the center might suppose. That is, from a location within the visible church, I want to reckon with what I take to be a significant kind of turbulence, a turbulence wrought by the spirit as God agitates women and men to meet the kingdom that is coming. Now, I'm obviously taking some risks with this proposal. On the one hand, it is surely right to honor those who witness, whose witness outshone the cruelty and stupidity of the old right, namely a ramshackle cluster of Christian, Jewish, interfaith, and non-Christian organizations, the, Clar the Charlottesville Clergy Collective, Congregate Charlottesville, and the vague coalition that goes under the name of Antifa. If God's kingdom is glimpsed through the efforts of these actors, just as it is glimpsed through preaching and sacraments, then there's a prima facie reason to look beyond the familiar binaries of church and world, church and society, sacred and secular. Theologians find ourselves under an obligation to talk positively and distinctly about a modality of divine and human action that might otherwise fall from view. On the other hand, Karl Barth warns me of grave dogmatic misadventure. While he did not suppose that, quote, the word of God could be confined to the proclamation of the existing church, the constructive move that I'm entertaining begins to blur the distinction between parables of the kingdom that is, discrete events that attest to the ways that Christ prophetically reigns outside the church. It blurs the distinction between parables of the kingdom and proclamation in a strict sense, as God's word is received, interpreted, and publicized in preaching and sacraments. In fact, might not this blurring and expansion of context augur a new form of neo-Protestantism with church, world, culture, and politics combining in ways that divert attention from God's self-revelation. Suddenly, one cannot now uncomplicatedly maintain that human beings are, quote, awakened, separated, and gathered by God to being in the visible church, and then say that the proclamation of the visible church comprises, quote, the raw material of dogmatics. It's not that that's untrue. It's just that an additional claim is being brought into play. The dogmatician is asked to acclaim the invisible church as it erupts upon the world in a highly worldly way through political action that lacks apparent connection to Christ and his spirit, yet somehow demands to be associated with the church and the kingdom of God. At this moment, with this type of move, we're taking leave of the dehistoricized eschatology of Romans 2 which sharply contrasted, quote, the first divine possibility with the last human possibility along the frontier of religion, and which blocked any correlation of Christian faith with religious socialism. We are now reaching into the territory of James Cone's early work, which identified liberative action as, quote, that which is not only consistent with the gospel, but 
is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Cohn also described the church as the place where, quote, wounds are being healed and chains are being struck off. It does not matter in the least whether the community of liberators designate their work as Christ's own work. What is important is that the oppressed are being liberated. Bart's cautions ring in my ears. Of that, you should have no doubt. But I also sincerely believe that the risk of dogmatic misadventure must be run. You're likely aware, I hope you're aware, that you're now attending a conference on Karl Barth and the Future of Liberation Theology. Kate Dugan and I chose this title for at least three reasons, to reckon with points of convergence and divergence between Barth and liberationist thinkers, to stimulate critical and constructive reflection relevant to our current moment, marked as it is by escalating threats to minoritized populations and communities, and third, to promote the idea that Bart and liberationist thinking can relate as a both and, not as an either or. With all that said, and this is why I think the risk needs to be run, it's important to be honest about the respective state of Bart studies and liberation theology, and to think clearly about what both fields need at present. Both fields are in good health. That is clear. Yet liberation theology, in all of its glorious diversity, does not actually need Karl Barth. Not as an interlocutor, not as an accrediting authority, not as a great thinker whose work provides a touchstone for critique. Even if liberation, can, liberation theology can and should learn from Barth, it is ultimately doing quite fine on its own. It draws vitality and relevance from its own wells. It makes plain how the last will be first and the first will be last, since God chose what is foolish in the world to shame what is wise and what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Bart studies, by contrast, needs liberation theology. Particularly, it needs liberation theology to help it think positively about political resistance in our current moment. Put a slightly different way, what has aptly been named the Bart Renaissance in North America ought not to continue to run under its own steam. If it is to have a future, or better, if it is to have a future which honors the man who inspires it, it must find ways to become orthodox, modern, and liberative. Now, to this end, I want to identify, this is the more particular side of the paper, three lines of inquiry that seem particularly important for contemporary Christian thought, and then to suggest how these lines of inquiry might be brought into conversation with Barth's theology. I'll begin broadly, but only for the purpose of ground clearing and scene setting, since my final destination coincides with my point of departure, namely Charlottesville and resistance to the alt-right. First, I'll offer some remarks on idolatry, which reflect, which connect with Barth's thinking on religion. Second, and more brief, briefly, some remarks on that vexed category of experience. Third, by way of Judith Butler, I consider the possibility that political assembly and protest could be viewed as laudable instances of impatience, apt human responses to God's weight for our participation in the covenant of grace. So first subsection on idolatry and ideology. If one were to go seeking scholarship that reckons with Calvin's sense that, quote, man's nature is, so to speak, a perpetual factory of idols, warped by a mind that, quote, dares to imagine a God according to its own capacity, you should go and read liberation theologians. Landmark works by Mary Daly, by James Cohn, by Ada Maria Azazi Diaz, and George Tink Tinker, and more recent texts by scholars such as Marcella Althaus Reed and Tracy West, these do far more than delineate long standing patterns of discrimination. They show also how certain habits of mind follow in the wake of discriminatory 
and injurious practices, and how those practices are naturalized and given sanction in theological discourse. The benefits that accrue from this work are easily summarized. Generally, liberationist critiques fund a valuably thickened account of sin, wherein hostility to God's ways and works is shown to correlate with the systemic disvaluation and mistreatment of God's creatures. More particularly, these works expose the myriad ways in which com Christian commitments are betrayed, with ideology supervening upon and distorting the understanding that is ingredient to faith. And the apt response to this situation stands in plain view, thanks to liberationist thinkers. What Paul Ricoeur famously called the hermeneutics of suspicion, that must become an abiding dimension of dogmatic reflection. We should ask at every juncture whose God it is that we're serving. Now, there are obvious points of connection between the ideology critique commended by liberationists and Barth's account of religion as a site of theological waywardness. To be sure, Barth's thinking on religion shifts around a bit. The essays collected in The Word of God and The Word of Man focus on the missteps of neo-Protestantism while evidencing some dismay at militarism and bourgeois mores. The second edition of Romans continues along this line while adding a sharp polemic against romanticism and a subtle Marxian edge. If you're thinking for the Marxian edge, think of when Barth talks about how religion is a drug that has been extremely skillfully administered. Church Dogmatics 1-2 reprises key elements of Romans, albeit with greater prominence to the idea that God can affect an aufhebung of religion. And then the Christian life advances a stirring account of the lordless powers, stretching, expanding a bit, which anticipates both the discourse of post-socialism and contemporary discussions of intersectionality. But granted all of these differences and these shifts in Barth's account of religion, there's an obvious constant, namely the insistence that Christians in general and theologians in particular easily trade attention to God's self-revelation for all too worldly standards. So both Barth and liberationist thinkers are relentless in asking whether a particular dogmatic perspective, despite appearances and intentions to the contrary, amounts to an exercise in false consciousness. Vince Lloyd's recent work provides a useful parallel. In a collection of S incisive studies titled Religion of the, Feed ne of Religion of the Field Negro, Lloyd finds evidence of a secular subversion of Christian theology by the ideology of whiteness, one often mystified by way of words like multiculturalism, love, and inclusivity, which for Lloyd tames the paradox of blackness and divinity and curtails the potency of resistance movements. So how do critiques of idolatry relate to liberation theology after Charlottesville? Among the addresses Barth gave after Hitler's seizure of power, the first commandment as an axiom of theology seems particularly pertinent. One finds here striking resonances with contemporary exaltations of blood, race, and nation. As is customary in his dogmatic work, Barth does not immediately name his political opponents. He opts instead to advance a decolonized Christian discourse. That is, a theological perspective which demonstrates what a refusal of volkish ideology might look like, which blows past warped alternatives with only occasional nods toward what is being rejected. So in this address, having made it amply clear that the first event, the first axiom of theology is the event of divine self-disclosure, which is in no way discernible in creation, it's only towards the end of his address that Bart inveighs against the willingness of, quote, recent Protestant, Protestant theology to bypass God's self-revelation in favor of, quote, an apology for nationhood, morality, and the state, 
which is itself, quote, an attempt to illuminate the heavens with a searchlight mounted on the earth. The address is an indirect and, in some respects, underdetermined critique of religion in action, but it is no less powerful for its indirection. In fact, the critique succeeds so well precisely because it shows how Volkish thinking is that weirdly alluring combination of laughable, lazy, and deeply dangerous. This is a critique, as well, that has worn the test of time. If the ideology of ethno-nationalism is at its most dangerous, not when it's espoused by extremist partisans, but when granted a foothold in mainstream political and theological discourse, Bart's voice is as timely as ever. It's also the case, however, that Bart cannot contend with our political moment in North America. Increasingly over the last century, there's been a chilling development of Volkish thinking in certain strands of North American theological and political discourse, often under the cover of so-called natural theology. Crucial here, and I owe much both to J. Cameron Carter and Willie Jennings for helping me to think about this, crucial is a toxic integration of anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic and anti-black and anti-brown habits of mind epitomized by the pseudo-history that underpins the Christian identity movement and neo-Nazi groups like Aryan Nations, and articulated on websites like Daily Stormer and the Right Stuff blog, alt-right ideology often depends on the assumption that the conspiratorial potency of Jews and people of color is such that whites as a people now teeter on the brink of extinction. This is the reason why you will not replace us so easily morphs into Jews will not replace us. And this is the reason why both slogans amount to a terrifying threat to anybody not deemed Caucasian. I know, in some respects, it's laughable. The ideology of whiteness in and of itself is theologically and politically vacuous. The vociferousness of its advocates bespeaks its fragility and laughableness. And for this reason, it's very tempting to dismiss it with a shrug and a, sh and a sigh. But the very fact that there is no there there with respect to this idol is a key part, if not the source, of its potency. The genius of the contemporary far right has been to transform vacuity fragility and laughableness into a supposedly oppressed racial identity, to, review, to view racial identity then as a battlefront, and to turn that battlefront into a mission to protect a putatively endangered people. Again, the fusion of anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic, anti-black, and anti-brown prejudice is not a 20th century invention. J. Cameron Carter, Jennings, and others have identified significant precedents in Christian theology, in colonialist discourse, and also the Western philosophical tradition. And these precedents absolutely must be engaged. Insofar as the Juden and Hrassenfragen comprise two sides of the same coin, theologians need to expose this currency as counterfeit. And part of that task involves the isolation of moments in which the ideology of whiteness supervenes upon Christians' attention to Israel, to Jew Jesus' Jewishness, and non-racialized visions of life in the spirit. Granted the importance of that genealogical work, still far-right activity in Charlottesville provides a striking example of how idolatry functions now, and therefore provides clarity <coughs> as to what contemporary contestations of this idol must entail. If, as Willie Jennings suggests, the New Testament bears witness to, quote, the spirit of God who was driving Israel towards the Gentiles in the space constituted by Jesus' body, then our covenantal obligation is to help to clear the path on which the spirit urges us to travel. Which is to say, more bluntly, 
the present and future theological battle against anti-Semitism must necessarily also be a battle against anti-Brown and anti-Black racism. And the present and future battle against anti-Black and anti-Brown racism is necessarily, must necessarily also be a battle against anti-Semitism. In fact, to put it even more strongly, for those of us disproportionately advantaged by the idol of whiteness in North America, there's another obligation. We must become race traitors. That is, we must learn to confess whiteness as a peculiarly stubborn sin, and we must pray that we are given the power to repent of it. We must treat it as an idol that, as God wills, should and will be mortified by the Spirit. So that's the first section on idolatry, second of third on experience. Bart's wariness toward experience as a site of theological reflection is rarely reprised in liberationist thinking. And there are plenty of good reasons for that. Whether it be a positive appraisal of black experience, an insistence that women's lives fund feminist theology and provide the ground of its proving, or queer delight in the interplay of divine and human desire, this experiential turn in liberationist discourse does not involve what Barth so feared, namely a disregard for God's sovereign ways and works. Quite the contrary. In much liberationist work, the category of experience is a way to acclaim God's action and presence in marginalized and denigrated communities. It is not as if the human is thought to have an innate capability for God. It's rather, to borrow from Barth, that, quote, the word of God finds us in the reality present to us, and that God gives us new ears to hear. The experiential turn in much liberationist discourse, in other words, is a function of the previously unrecognized reach of God's saving and sustaining action. Now, to draw attention to the place, of function, place and function of experience in liberationist theologies does not I think, invalidate Barth's earlier concerns. Again, the experience to which Bart, the experience at which Bart took aim, after all, had nothing to do with an epistemology of the oppressed, but everything to do with an epistemology of the advantaged. His concern, Bart's concern, was interlocking habits of mind that aggregated to a hegemonic culture of evasion wherein God is turned into, quote, an attainable and entirely useful tool for life. Liberationist appeals to experience, by contrast, are born of the determination to challenge all too human suppositions about where, when, and through whom God presents God's self to us. So that Elizabeth Johnson's classic work on the Trinity commends, quote, a creative naming toward God from the matrix of women's experience, that does not now mean that theology exchanges the revelation of God for the experience of women and therefore collapses theology into anthropology. That's not the case. While the early chapters of She Who Is suddenly attend to women's experience, what authorizes this attention is Johnson's capacious vision of God's activity as spirit, Christ, and Mother Sophia, a vision that is shaped by Johnson by some remarkable exegetical work and a canny engagement with Aquinas. Equally, James Cohn's claim that, quote, black experience is the source of black theology must not be read in isolation from Cohn's conviction that the activity of the risen Christ comprises the leading edge of God's action in history. For Cohn, it is because Christ is, quote, not dead but resurrected and alive in the world today, continuing the work initiated in his proclamation and enactment of the kingdom. It's because of that that the condition, witness, and experience of those who contest oppression has theological significance. Let me be clear, what I'm suggesting here is first that the category of experience in many, not all, in many liberationist texts should be read as a symptom 
of an expansive account of God's sovereign activity, and that two, recognizing this point goes some way to avoiding a standoff between Barth's theology and the positive valuation of experience that is found in liberationist texts. I would further gloss the second point in terms of a collective admonition and counsel for those of us in the field of Bart studies. Let us consign our dogmatic neuralgia about experience to the past. Let us begin to value and esteem the counter-hegemonic deployment of experience in liberationist discourses. Barth's critique of neo-Protestantism should not be taken out of context, nor should it be weaponized to discredit perspectives that emerge from historically marginalized communities. It is not as if feminist, African-American, Latinx, queer, and indigenous accounts of experience amount to what Barth called exercises in self-assurance wherein theologians, this is Bart again, handle the, world, handle the word and faith like capital at their, uh, at their, um, uh, capital at their use. Capital at their disposal, I apologize. A better option, and one that I want to develop in this next constructive section before wrapping up briefly, is to approach and receive accounts of experience in light of those moments in which the covenant of grace comes into view, with God's discreet commands realized in obedience and freedom. Third constructive moment. It's called Assembly and the Kingdom. Judith Butler's book, Notes Toward a Performative Theory of Assembly, provide a useful route back to Charlottesville. In a characteristically rich text, Butler's principal objective is to advance a theoretical understanding of popular demonstrations. Her particular concern is to honor the ways in which an alliance or assembly arises. These are terms that bear the imprint of Gilles Deleuze and Jasper Pua. An alliance or assembly is diverse bodies acting in concert, quote, taking up space and obdurately living for the purpose of contesting injustice. At stake for Butler in this text is the performance of popular sovereignty, occasions in which bodies converge upon a particular patch of creation and constitute a we that demands recognition. While the book opens with remarks on Tahrir Square, which was a key location in the Egyptian uprising in 2010, there's an obvious point of connection to the increasingly international Black Lives Matter movement especially when Butler reflects on the US Constitution and argues that assembly proves the meaning of we the people, since, quote, the performative enactment of the truth is the way of making evident that very truth. So in Butler's reckoning, the heartbeat of democratic life is collective action against those economic, gendered, and racialized conditions that impede the pursuit of life, liberty, and flourishing. Through these actions, Butler says, their quote, opens up time and space outside and against the established architecture and temporality of the regime. A time and space that I would add is filled with the voices of a forged, a newly forged assembly of people. Now Butler's work provides a useful gloss on Charlottesville particularly when applied to what I called earlier that ramshackle cluster of counter-protesters, Christians, non-Christians, and others, who showed up on May 14th in response to the first alt-right incursion, who protested the Ku Klux Klan on June 7th, and who disrupted far-right actions on August 11th and 12th. With respect to August 12th, in fact, we have a case study in what Butler calls bodily vulnerability and coalitional politics. Countless church services and events that rejected white supremacist ideology, and in the case of those who assembled to protest the Unite the Right rally, a demonstration of what it means to think vulnerability and agency together, with clergy and faith activists holding ground, and a more amorphous mass of individuals, many affiliated with Antifa, acting to preserve that vulnerability through a tactical use of defensive violence. 
there's also a powerful opening for theological reflection here. When Butler chose her title, Notes Toward a Performative Theory of Assembly, I seriously doubt that she was thinking about the Greek word for assembly, ecclesia, appropriated by New Testament writers to describe the early Christian community. Even so, I think it's apt to construe the assemblies of county protesters in Charlottesville as telling us, in some way, about what church can be, and perhaps what church should be. At issue here is a gathering of bodies, a sharing and occupying of space predicated on the belief that idolatry must not have its way, that the future proposed by the idolaters can be outbid by something different. The line of clergy and faith leaders who encircled the park and blockaded the southeast staircase, and this and is crucial, and the mess of counter-protesters protesters who rushed to their defense, adding blockade to blockade. Those assemblies do not strike me as just analogies to church. Those assemblies are the church, are the invisible enactment of the covenant of grace in a particular patch of space and time. At a key point in the dogmatics early on, Bart writes about how the word, quote, comes as a summons, and the hearing of it finds found in a human being is the right hearing of obedience or the wrong hearing of obedience. That claim was ventured in a prolegomenal theological epistemology that was always fringed with political meaning. And that political meaning finds new application today with the response of the summons of the word being both the premeditated decision among the faithful to assemble, to put their bodies on the line, to render themselves vulnerable for the sake of the gospel, and the spontaneous split-second decision of an assembly, another assembly, moved to defend those who would bear Christian witness, to absorb the hate and violence of the far right, and maybe go down swinging too, for the sake of a gospel they likely do not acknowledge. At this point, just to keep going, it's possible to reprise my earlier connection of church and the kingdom. On one level, we perhaps here have a theological corollary to the pol political assertion of we the people. In the same moment, there is a performance of democratic sovereignty, what Butler calls a form of reflexive self-making, which contests the pseudo-assembly of the far right. There might also be a performance of what an alternative mode of human sociality looks like, a graced time and space outside the established architecture of the regime of white supremacism, an advent of Christ's body as it reaches towards our Lord's second coming. On another level, we might have here the recapitulation of the diversity manifest at creation's beginning, and therefore a proleptic eruption of the kingdom. A jumble of bodies and genders and sexes which mocks, which mocks the empty ideology of identitarian white nationalism because we know that ideology of white nationalism cannot express itself otherwise than in a boring, tawdry block of white, male, heterosexual, and non-Jewish bodies. We have the beginning, a recapitulation of creation in all of its chaos and glorious diversity, which challenges, which mocks that empty ideology. At this moment, the white nationalist cry, you will not replace us, is being given striking rebuttal with this is what creation looks like, being coextensive with that more familiar slogan, this is what democracy looks like. So is this not something like the kingdom coming in power? Maybe, <laughs> only maybe. You'll notice there's a bunch of sub subjunctives uh, that are peppering remarks, and those subjunctives betray obvious nervousness. I worry, I generally worry that I am moving perilously close 
to the politicized Hermannian stance that Barth came to reject. A stance wherein social justice movements are, quote, this is Bart, the greatest and most urgent word of God to the present, a direct continuation of the spiritual power which entered into history and life with Jesus. And granted that I've pushed some very forthright claims, I think nervousness should be voiced at this juncture. If it is wrong to presume the holiness of any instance of Christian proclamation, no matter its apparent sincerity and profundity, so it is wrong to equate the church and the kingdom with social protest. But, once again, to resist a loose and always indirect identification of the kingdom with those who assembled to resist the far right, that risks a worrying kind of theological inarticulacy. It would signal a desire to hold political protest at arm's length from the church. It would suggest that proclamation could be exhausted by preaching and the distribution of sacraments. But we need to move beyond that in articulacy. Inarticulacy is exactly what we must avoid. Again, Vince Lloyd, writing in a manner that reprises Cohn's early work, he aims to honor the tradition of black organizing in the US, the contestation of apartheid in South Africa, and more recently, the BLM movement. And he does so by trying to treat all of these events as instances in which the secular is overturned and whiteness is overcome. This is Vince. The movement toward liberation on this reckoning is God acting in the world, a moment in which something like the church invisible manifests. I'm going to demur with many of the details of Lloyd's theological program, but I share his determination to give meaning to these movements and moments, and to read them, perhaps, as instances in which the church is, in some hard-to-define way, constantly reborn. When the kingdom erupts, God's patience, which is so typically tested by our way waywardness, that patience is rewarded by grace and through the Spirit, with our participation in the covenant of grace. If and when God assembles God's church, the dogmatician must sit up and take notice. Just a final brief remark. This is a long quotation from Church Dogmatics 4.1. I've quoted it before, but I'm kind of obsessed with it, so you'll have to uh, humor me. God will not allow his last word to be fully spoken or the consummation determined, accomplished, and proclaimed by him to take place in its final form until God has heard a human answer to it, a human yes, until his grace has found its correspondence in a voice of human thanks from the depths of the world reconciled with him, until here and now, before the dawning of his eternal Sabbath, God has received praise um, from the midst of his human creatures. So great is God's grace. So broad is the reach of his condescension. So serious is the solidarity in which he has committed himself with us human beings in the person of his son. So great that God wills a body, an earthly and historical form of the existence of this head, in order that this may happen. God still gives the world space, time, and existence. He allows the end time to dawn and to persist. If, as I mentioned earlier, Bart's actualism renders the church as much a mobile event as an empirically circumscribable institution, these words of Bart's add another layer of meaning, a layer of meaning which plays on the edges of the dogmatics, just as it's played on the edges of this lecture. That layer of meaning has to do with God's patience for the world the gifting of time and space to ensure that human action has meaning and consequence and to allow the covenant of grace to become genuinely two-sided. Barth's treatment of patience is arguably, as well, an improvement on the broader Protestant tradition. It's still possible to say that God is patient in face of human sin, patience in the sense of long-suffering. Yet Barth nests the concept of patience within a broader statement about divine permission as a dimension of providence and about human freedom. 
Liberationist voices, and more particularly the witness of those who acted in Charlottesville, enable another development of this idea of patience. What is God waiting for? What role does the church have by grace in ushering in the kingdom? One answer. What God waits for is our impatience. The impatience of assembly, intemperately and imperfectly ventured in opposition to idolatry. God is waiting on and waiting for God's people to become restless in ways that Augustine could not have anticipated. To, be to become, to borrow from the late and great James Cone, quote, restless with regard to the imperfections of the present. Impatience, then, is the gift of the kingdom. And impatience is the task of those who are now called by Christ's spirit to participate in its inbreaking. Vini Creata Spiritus. Thank you.